New Thought Media Network. We are a global broadcast network of positive music, media, and entertainment. Inspiring humanity's evolution along the journey of enlightenment and creating a world of love, peace, empowerment, and prosperity for all. New Thought Media Network. Positively inspiring. Morning. My name's uh, Reverend Dr. Ken Gordon. I um, I'm a retired religious science minister. I don't think I've ever said that, uh, which is interesting because I can remember the first time I ever said I am a religious science minister, and that uh, it had the same emotional impact on me as just saying that. Today I'm going to talk on the phases of uh, subjective life, which is really a fancy way of saying what's life all about. What's what's the meaning of life? You know, from the very beginning of time, um, uh, philosophers have been saying that uh, there are certain stages of, of life, and, and Dr. Ernest Holmes was no different. And those stages really look something like this, and some do seven, some do ten, some do four, some do three. Nevertheless, here's what it is. is we're born into this world, and uh, our first stage is mimicry which means basically that what we do is we take what we've learned uh, up until that particular point and we try to emulate it. You, you see someone in your life that you really admire and you say, gee, I want to be just like that. I want to be just like dad or I want to be just like grandpa or I want to be just like the millionaire next door, whatever it happens to be. And then you, you fall into that and you basically begin to formulate your own life based on the mimicking of what you see in society around you. The next stage is a self-examination. At some point, most of us, and I would, I would guess that the vast majority of people who are viewing this are people who have gone through self-examination or are entering into self-examination. But that's the stage where you come to and you sort of ask yourself, what's this all about? What's going on in your life? What's happening? How's it uh, unfolding? How's it out picturing? And what is your emotional state? What is your subjective state, your emotional uh, thinking, feeling state that that's back behind it as opposed to your objective? The, the third one is as you get more embroiled and more aware of who you are or who you think you are, what happens is you fall into an area of commitment where you begin committing yourself to the activities that you're doing and building your own structure so that you no longer have to discuss or argue or debate it. You just simply fall into it and it becomes who you are and the way of life that you have. <clears throat> the third stage is the stage of surrender, which is where you begin to turn it over to other people. You turn your life work over to it or what you believe. You might pass on your opinions and your beliefs to your grandchildren or your children and you begin to actually formulate that stage where perhaps you're going to step out of it. And a happy life really is dependent upon asking the right questions, putting the questions out there. Ralph Waldo Emerson said 99% of people live lives of quiet desperation. And I think it was Shakespeare that said a life unexamined isn't worth living. So it's important for us to really define what those questions are, what, what we want to ask, because here's what we know in the science of mind. We know that the minute that you ask the question, the minute that you put it forward and, and place it out into the universe for an answer, that the universe begins to answer it. It shows up in every aspect of your life. Everything that you do from that point forward is really a demonstration of the question that you put forward if you stay diligently on it. 
and, and lay it out there. So if you ask, you know, what is the meaning of my life? Um, 20 minutes later, whatever happens and occurs in your life can be a symbol or can be uh, an instruction as to uh, what it is that's going on in your being and in your life that's going to help move you forward. And sometimes it takes a bit of time to get through, and I'll speak for myself here, not for you, to get through the rather thick skull that I have so that I don't catch it all automatically and all the time. It, it works the same way as, as spiritual mind treatment does. The, when, when, when you put an affirmative prayer out into the universe, the answers start showing up immediately, and it's up to you to be able to recognize or observe it or feel it and to see how it connects or how it doesn't connect with what you're, you're asking and the question that's put there. So we kind of move through those four stages in each of our lives. And when we're aware of it, what it gives us the opportunity to do is it gives us the opportunity to create a quality that, that fits in there because we're aware of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And it awakens within us all of the necessary follow-up questions that need to be answered as we move into life. So, you know, I, I think that probably the first tool that I would provide would be the tool that it's important to sit down and ask yourself the question, what is it that I believe and why do I believe it? What are my values? Uh, what are the principles that I live my life on and why do I do it that way? So that what we can do is we can, um, we can build a ladder so that we can see tangible evidence of the answers coming back so that we build and develop within ourselves a trust and a faith that when we put it out there, we get the answer. Now, that doesn't mean that the answer always works in perfection and that it always matches who we think. Um, I, I, I know that when, when I first entered life that there were people that I admired in my world around me. And as I got to my teenage years, I began to try to mimic them more and more and more so that what I could do is uh, live the life that I thought I wanted to live that looked like what they were doing. Um, um, and a personal example for it would be um, I came from a re relatively humble family. We didn't have a lot of money and that sort of thing. My dad was not an overly happy camper uh, most of his life. Um, he, he had a lot of um, unexpressed, uh, unexpressed qualities and uh, um, skills that he never really applied in his life. He never had the opportunity. And because he wasn't of a teaching like this and because he got caught up in the day-to-day -day grind of living and life, he never really found himself being able to express himself to the degree that he wanted in the areas that he wanted to do. As opposed to my, my father-in-law, who was a very successful entrepreneur and had uh, lots of money, which is really, as a teenager, what I wanted to do. And, and he had lots of uh, temporal uh, proof of it in his life, uh, airplanes, boats, uh, nice houses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I can remember that when I came to my formative years and met my wife and we began to to date and to get along and that sort of thing, that, that what I wanted to do was enter that world. I thought this has got to be the answer for me. I've just got to go out there and make a success of myself in business. I have to be uh, Mr. Know-it-all. I've got to have a lot of stuff in my life to prove that I, I'm who I say I am or who I want to be. So, I, you know, I went to work like everybody else, and I, I, I did very, very well. I, I ended up running a corporation before I was 30 years old. I, I uh, succeeded in a lot of things. But I got to tell you, um, that mimicry doesn't work or didn't work for me. What I, what I found myself with was I found myself in, in a terrible state of ennui. Um, not depression, I wouldn't say, although it could be closely aligned, but I found myself in a place where I really wasn't that happy. I had a beautiful wife and two beautiful children, or at the time, one beautiful child. And I basically thought that working hard was the way to get it and to keep it. So I stopped hanging on to my my family. I, I stopped spending time with them. I, I, I'd go to work at six o'clock in the morning. I'd come home at eight o'clock at night. I'd fall asleep on the couch for three hours. 
I'd get up at uh, five and go back to work the next day. And I would do that seven days a week, 52 weeks of the year. And it didn't take me very long before I really fell into that state of ennui, that state of depression. And, and, and I remember when, when it happened, uh, you know, there, there were clues that were out there and I wasn't connected enough to ask questions. I thought this is what life looks like. This is what life's supposed to be like. It's the same life as my father-in-law seemed to lead, except without the money. It's the same life as my father led. But I thought, hmm. And one day the it occurred to me that the mimicry wasn't working for me, that, that this really wasn't the direction I wanted to go. And, and really, I can remember the day that it really became obvious to me what was going on and what was happening. And it was a morning that I got up and I went to the office. And when I got to the office, I looked down and I saw that I had one brown shoe on and one black shoe on. That's how disconnected and uh, how much of a stupor I was in. And when I realized that and saw it, I decided that I needed to change some things. And the minute that I decided to need to change some things, everything started to happen to make that so. Um, I ended up, uh, the company that I was running uh, decided to move the head office to Eastern Canada. And um, although they offered me a position there, I chose not to go. So I found myself suddenly you know, with a big void in my life. And I was still trying to live that life of mimicry, that, that phase of subjective life. And, and what occurred to me was um, I began to ask, it, is, isn't there more to it than this? And like I said, I had no realization that the answer was already written in the stars, so to speak, that the universe knew how to, uh, how to deliver it to me without question and without hesitation. So I just began to grind forward in my day-to-day -day things. I sat down and began to write a book and I did a lot of fly fishing. And then I had an offer to move to Southern California and become a farmer. And that sounded good. So I moved to Southern California and began farming. And I love farming. You know, Henry David Thoreau said that all farmers are mystics. And that's something that I found about the work that I, that I enjoyed immensely. And I built a very large farm, 1,100 acres at one particular point. Because what happened was I was still mimicking. I, I still thought the business didn't look like sitting on a tractor uh, bailing hay. Business looked like <clears throat> having 16 employees doing the work for you and you got to boss them around or tell them what to do. And, and in turn, you had the responsibility of deriving the income to pay them and do everything else. So I fell quickly into that whole, that, that whole type A personality again. And so I did that. And I, about that time, I, uh, I had already found the center in the church and the questions had begun to come forward. And I began to ask them clearly, what is my life about? What is this phase and what's, what's happening here? And as I began to define the questions, the answers began to show up and it didn't take me very long before I discovered that uh, I was deriving all of my income from my farm and from my work but all of the pleasure I had in life, I was, I was getting from doing my practitioner work. I was getting from participating with humanity. And so I sat down with a piece of paper and I made a pro and con list. And what turned out was exactly what I just said, was that all the satisfaction I was getting in life was not from doing the work that I was doing that I thought that I needed, that I was mimicking the past. What was really showing up was the fact that I needed to go a different pathway and a different route. And from that moment forward, um, I continued on in classes, got into ministerial school, et cetera. But I still would fall back into that ennui because my self-examination hadn't come to a place yet where I had some kind of definitive answer to it. And I, I remember once um, farming that I, I was really in a state and I can remember phoning my prayer partner at the time uh, Reverend Tony Hagee who wasn't a reverend then it was a classmate of mine and I remember phoning and saying to him Tony tell me <coughs> this is what's going on in my life tell me what I need to do because I, I need an answer I need you to give me some advice I, I don't want you to 
say you're going to treat for me. I'm, I'm already doing that. I was already becoming a practitioner or a practitioner. And I remember Tony took a moment and he just hesitated just a moment. And he said, okay, I'm going to give you three things to do. I'm going to give you three steps for you to take that's going to get you out of this state. I said, great, what are they? I'll do them. He said, well, the, f- the first thing I want you to do, he said, was I want you to start a gratitude list. And I, I want you to do the gratitude list in such a way that you never are grateful for the same thing. So every night before you go to bed, you write down 10 things that you're grateful for. And you can never repeat what it is so that you can say, I'm grateful for my children. Well, that's you said that once. You can't say it. You said that on Monday. You can't say it on Wednesday. Oh, my gosh, did I ever discover there was a lot to be grateful for in my life. It got to the point where um, I I was trying to pick up the 10 things that I was grateful for when I was running my life or doing my life from day to day. And and they were never ending. It was possible to do it. I know it might sound impossible to continue to do that, but it isn't. Now, I did that for maybe a decade and I never ran out of things, but uh, somehow or other I shifted out of that. The second thing that he said that I should do is he said, you should do something totally different than you're doing right now. You should uh, take a class. You should participate in something different. He said, you know, I know that you're very involved in classes at the church, the science of mind classes. And he said, I I, I don't want you to stop doing that, but I want you to take a class that you normally wouldn't take. So I went to the college, the university that was near me, and I took a creative writing course. And it moved me. It shifted me. It shifted that and we, and it suddenly uh, it sparked my imagination. There was something fresh that I didn't know and moved me to a place where my creativity got to be expressed. And so I wrote several short stories, which I thought were good, which I still think are good, and uh, enjoyed myself and began to shift. And all the time that this was happening, which was maybe perhaps a two months period of time, I could feel my life shifting. I could feel the vitality of life coming back into me again. The third thing that he asked me to do or told me to do is he said, you know, um, I know that you do prayer work every day, which I do. And he said, so what what I want you to do is I I, I want you to start praying for something and do your treatment for something that's bigger than yourself. Something that is beyond your capacity to be able to understand how it could ever happen. When I was in university, when I was younger, I was uh, flirting on the edges of the peace movement. And uh, so I I determined that what I would do is I would pray every day for world peace. I had no idea how it could happen. I had no idea how it was going to unfold or what was going to occur in order to be able to make that happen. But I did trust and have faith in the universe knowing the answer. And so I began to treat for world peace, and I began working on that. Uh, I'll skip back to the beginning of my talk here when I said, you know, when you ask a question, the universe gives you everything that's required and everything that's necessary for you to find the answer. Your life begins to show. As a friend of mine said, your life leaves clues. So uh, I can remember when I first got into it, I'd been doing it for maybe uh, three, four months. And... uh, I was an adamant peacenik at the time, and uh, I was really moving in that direction. And that was about the same time that the first Gulf War began. And uh, you might remember that with uh, George Bush Sr. moving everybody into Kuwait and doing all that stuff. And I remember that I began that era being opposed to the war. But watching television, reading the newspaper, participating with friends in conversation, much to my uh, shame, much to my uh, embarrassment, what happened was I began to shift out of believing in world peace and instead shifted into believing that this was a necessary part of life. Now, I share that with you because it would have been easy then just to drop it all and say that wasn't the truth. But in reality, it was exactly the truth. Not that we needed to go to war, but that I needed to be self-examining myself and what I believe and what I hold to be true. And it didn't take very long before I was back doing treatment for world peace again and saw the error of my ways, giving up the vision instead of following through on it. 
And it taught me some valuable lessons. So it opened the door for my own self-reflection. It opened the door for me to look at it and say, why did I do that? What happened? What occurred there that, that made me switch what such a strong belief was? And that really moved me into the third step that I was talking about, which is the commitment level. Suddenly what happened was I became committed to <coughs> a vision that was bigger than myself. I became committed to something that I didn't know how to make happen, but that I knew that the universe could. So in the practice of that, it began to develop my faith. It began to develop it, my, my belief system. And when I say faith, I'm not talking about faith in something outside of myself, but faith in the fact that the universe is going to provide the answers for me if I ask them and if I'm open to and willing to uh, hear them and embody them and bring them into my being. That really kicked me off on uh, the rest of my life, which was to enter into ministry, to, uh, to hold before me a vision of a world that works for everyone, to recognize my purpose was to awaken humanity. And that really structured and was the blueprint for my life for the next 35 years. That I got to move into that area and that zone and uh, be totally and absolutely committed to it, despite what other people might say, or despite the fact that some people might say that that was an impossibility, or how's that ever going to occur? Or how's that ever going to happen? And that activity was really a reflection of that um, subjective phase of my life, that self-examination phase. And so I did that for up, up until last year, and I'm probably still doing it on a very, very deep level. And I still treat every day for, for world peace as well. But I now am beginning to understand as I move into another phase of my life, this, this phase of perhaps giving some stuff up, um, turning it over to other people and empowering somebody else to do it. Um, my, my whole view on life is beginning to transform and change and I'm becoming what they say with regard to that surrender is you become way more independent. Uh, you, you honor and value your own thoughts, your own beliefs, your own feelings. And when you look back on life, and I'm not meaning to sound like some old archaic guy who's looking back on my life because I still have a lot of life to live. But you look back on it and you say, you know what? I'm happy with what was created in this experience. Now, I opened by talking about my father-in-law and by my father and other people who were models in my life when I was in the mimicking stage. And I'll share with you that the one thing that I observed and watched with them, and it certainly isn't hold true for everyone, but it holds true for the people that I can remember, is I don't think they were ever really truly happy. The only reason to ask the question, what's life about, is to really increase that, that, that joy in your life. I think that they were mimicking and they never got out of it. And I observe, once again, life that goes on around me, and I see a lot of people who never grew out of that. They never stepped into those phases. One thing I bless science of mind for is not just the life that, that, that I took from it, but also I bless it because it really prompted and promoted me to ask the questions that were necessary for me to ask, and then await with anticipation and expectation the answers, and to be able to see it and feel it. So when Dr. Holmes says, you always know what you need to know when you need to know it, what he's really talking about is he's talking about our need in life to be clear on what it is we want and what it is we want to know not to build it on what we've had in the past or the experiences we've had, but to build it on a day-to-day -day basis. Who do I want to be and what kind of life do I want to live? And then ask the question, and how do I get there? And that question is really versed this way. What do I need to know in order to arrive at that place? 
So I trust that you've enjoyed this. I trust that it could be helpful for you and know you're loved and honored. God bless you. I'll open up for questions now if anyone has any. Okay, if there are no questions, then <clears throat> here's what I'll do. I'll tell you a story which I think uh, reflects on, on what I just said. I, I better put some brackets around it in the first place by telling you that I first heard this story at a Sillimore years ago by a good friend of mine, Dr. Candace Beckett. And uh, that, that I've given it, I've spoken it a couple of times over the years, and I've learned to make sure that I put a codicil in at the end so that you know what I'm talking about. So here it goes. This man is out seeking for the meaning of life. He's out searching for what the meaning of life is. And he's traveling around, he's going to all of the great avatars that he can think of. He's going to all the great uh, teachers that he can think of, and he's asking them, what is the meaning of life? And the answer when he goes to the first person is the meaning of life is that you really control, you are the hub of your own being. And as the hub of your own being, what happens is you control what you have in your life. You control how you feel in your life. And so the meaning of life is to make sure that you do things that are authentic to who you are so that what you can do is you can feel good about them and move forward from there. And the guy goes after the first person, he asks the question and the answer comes and he says, uh, no, I don't think that's it. So he goes seeking another person and another great teacher and he gets to that teacher and sits at the foot of that teacher for a while and he, he asks the same question. And what is the meaning of life? And the answer is, you are really the hub of your own being and your own experience. And you create and develop and build your own value in what you get out of life. I said, no, no, that, that's, that's not it. I've heard that before. That, that's not the one. So he goes seeking and he finds a third person and a fourth person and a fifth person. And always the answer is the same thing. You are the hub of your own life. And you control what you think and what you feel. And the value that you put into the world comes from that. Finally, he just gives up in desperation and in ennui, uh, depression. And he goes to India and he finds a great guru. And he goes to the guru and he says to the guru, what is the meaning of life? And the guru says, oh, well, I can't tell you that. He says, what do you mean I can't tell you that? He said, well, you haven't earned the right or the privilege to have it yet. And he says, well, how do I earn the right and the privilege? He says, well, come live here and I'll put you to work. And 10 years from now, if you work well and you work hard, I will give you the answer to your question. Oh, spectacular. So he goes and he gets the job of picking rocks in a field. So for 10 years, he's remembering, oh, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? And he goes out every morning at, when the sun rises and he picks rocks and he eats meager food and he comes home at dark and he goes to sleep and just tumbles into sleep and 10 years pass. And after 10 years of this, he goes to the great guru and he says, okay, I've been here for 10 years. You promised me you'd tell me the meaning of life if I, if I only were to do this work for you and I've done it and diligently. And the guru says, yes, you have. It's very, very good. Ask me the question. And he says, what is the meaning of life? And the man says, the guru says, the meaning of life is that you are the hub of your own experience, that your thoughts and your feelings create the value that you get out of life. Oh, I get it, he says. I finally get, I hear it. Oh my God. I've heard that so many times before, but I never got it. Why? Why? Why didn't I get it the first time? And the guru says, because you're stupid. Now, here comes the codicil. Stupid is derived from the word stupor. We in life, oftentimes, some in life, are in a stupor. We don't even think that there's an alternative to the way that we live our lives right now. 
And because we don't think that there's an alternative, we just keep grinding away, trying to move forward. Obviously, the moral is there is an answer. And that that answer is as simple as that. And that when we break free from our stupor, what happens is that it becomes apparent and real for us. Hopefully, you won't have to work 10 years in the field picking rocks to be able to get the answer that's right smack in front of your face. That's it. Any more questions or any questions at all, I'm, I'm open it again. Ah, what amps up your faith in oneness? Um, looking at it from a larger point of view than rather than small point of view. Dr. Holmes says that we view life like looking through a keyhole. Well, expand the size of your keyhole. Begin to realize that your neighbor, the person next to you, your partner, the person in another country is you, that there is a connectivity to it. And begin to ask that question and observe it in how you look at life and what goes on around you. And as you observe it, it becomes undeniable. And as it becomes undeniable, it builds and develops your faith in it so that you understand and appreciate it. And if you do it diligently enough and long enough, what occurs for you or what might occur from you is that it becomes part of your being and part of your life so that you no longer have to stretch to make it happen because it shows up right in front of you. And Wayne, you and I are one. The difference between us is zip. We're the same being, the same entity, uh, but not with the same experience. And the experience is created because you are the hub of your own life and you get to create that experience. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> next week is uh, Reverend Robert. He's going to be talking about finding the Christ. And we thank Reverend Michelle for last week with uh, what the mystics taught. So I look forward to seeing you next week, Robert. Know you're loved.